Chapter 3 The next day, Alan sat in the back of the lecture area, waiting for Rishi Suraj to come and give his daily talk. He glanced over at the woman next to him. She was dressed all in orange, orange blouse, top, and bandana. Her eyes were closed as she swayed and chanted, Jai, Jai, Rishi Ji Jai. About 100 other Westerners were there as well, waiting for the arrival of their teacher. After a while, the chanting quieted down, and a small Indian man wearing a robe and a cap on his head walked onto the stage. He sat down on a white couch as an aide nervously adjusted the microphone in front of him. Then he began to speak. Yes, we are unhappy. Yes, we are soul-starved. Yes, the world mocks our longing. But it has always been so. Throughout his talk, the sibilant sounds of Rishi Suraj washed through Alan's brain like floodwaters rushing through a dried up canyon. Alan stared at the man, feeling himself hardly in his body. When Rishi Suraj was done, he received a garland of flowers from one of his devotees, and then he left the dais. But Alan continued sitting as the lecture hall emptied out, almost unable to get up. Then he felt someone tap him on the shoulder. Hello, greeted the woman. Alan was surprised to see an Indian among all the Westerners. She was a petite woman, hardly over five feet, dressed in a pale yellow sari. Hello, Alan responded. It is a great privilege to hear the master talk. I am Mahadevi, she said with a slight bow. I'm Alan Hennessy, he replied, sensing that she had already taken notice of his ruby-studded Harvard ring. Are you one of the Hennessys? Sorta, he said resignedly, feeling that the dynasty's standard had now become implanted on Indian soil. No matter. We are just souls on the path here, Mahadevi replied soothingly. You have a place to stay? Yeah. Excellent. It is good having you here, Alan, she said, giving him a firm handshake. Alan sighed as this bird of a woman left him, taking his anonymity with her. After the lecture on the second day, Mahadevi once again returned to talk to Alan. Rishiji wants to speak to you, she said, signaling for him to follow her. Alan could feel the envious gaze of all the people around him as they headed for Rishi Suraj's personal quarters. Alan walked past his security guard and into the house, where he took off his sandals, feeling the coolness of the marble floor under his feet. In the next room was Rishi Suraj, sitting in a chair draped with a tiger skin. The room was dimly lit, but Alan could clearly make out the man's features. He was a small, light-skinned Indian, with long gray and black hair that fell to his shoulders. But it was his eyes that entranced him. They were wide, luminous, and piercing. Rishi Suraj gestured for Alan to sit before him. As he did, Mahadevi brought in a silver tray with two drinks on it. Rishi Suraj reached for one and signaled for Alan to do the same. They were lussies, a concoction of blended yogurt, lime juice, and sugar. After Rishi Suraj had drained his glass, he nodded slowly at Alan. Let us be together, he began soothingly. You are settled, hmm? It is good, very good. You want to grow, I can see. This is all very good. His words came out slowly, like raw honey pouring. Alan listened intently, trying to drink it all in. Stay and you will be great, hmm? The world needs a savior. Is that not true? Yes, you will do good work here. And I have something special for you, he added, turning to Mahadevi, who came forward, handing Alan a necklace of wooden beads with a picture of Rishi Suraj at its center. Wear this mala, it will protect you, Rishi Siraj said as Alan put it around his neck. Good, 
Now I want you to share your good fortune with the others. Thank you, Alan said, feeling quite stoned from the whole encounter. Mahadevi ushered him out of the room, where he saw an Indian woman in her mid-twenties dressed in a red sari. Her black hair was braided down to the small of her back, and her wrists were awash in gold bangles. Alan glanced momentarily at the brown swath of skin showing between the wraps of her sari. Hello, he said, stunned by her beauty. Namaste, she greeted him, her palms pressed together. Namaste, he replied, knowing that the word meant loosely, I bow to the light in you. You have just seen my papaji? She asked with a smile. Is your father? Alan asked, as she nodded back. I'm Ronnie, she said, extending her bangled hand. Alan, he replied, shaking it. You just arrived a few days ago, she asked. Yeah, yesterday. And you have already received his mala. You must be very blessed. Alan shrugged his shoulders. Oh, well, enjoy your stay. I must be going, she said, walking toward her father's room. Alan watched as she left, enjoying the encounter. But his run-ins with Mahadevi were a totally different matter. She would seek him out, a word here, a question there, all seemingly quite innocent. But Alan could sense her eyes prying on him like a hawk as he walked about the ashram grounds. One morning, he answered a knock on the door of the shack where he was staying in and found Mahadevi before him, a smile stretching her pinched face. Good morning, she said brightly. I hope this is not too early, but I wanted to surprise you. No, it's all right. Let me put a shirt on and I'll be out, he said, going back inside. By the time he came out again, Mahadevi was sitting on a brightly checkered blanket while several women scurried around her setting up a picnic breakfast. Please, Alan requested. I don't want to be treated special. I know, I know, agreed Mahadevi, shooing her minions away. Just humor my quaint Indian hospitality. Sit, please. Alan sighed, joining Mahadevi. As they began to eat the spicy parantas, yogurt and pickled mango that had been placed before them, Mahadevi began to talk about Rishi Siraj's mission. Fear and guilt are the two curses of mankind. That is why all these people have come here, to get healed of it. Why aren't there any Indians here? Alan asked, as Mahadevi's face became even more pinched.